Okay, um, so we're going to, this, uh, this lecture is going to be a little bit different than what we've done before in the classes. So there's a lot of value in going through material in a textbook and learning the fundamentals of something in terms of formulas and theory. But there's, there's also value in real life uh, experience. And so what, what we did with the last class was at the end we sort of got some real life experience to see what these experiments would tell us in terms of the force on a con current carrying conductor. And then because of that, uh, I don't know why he keeps doing this. It gets really confused when I have multiple keynotes open, but that's okay. Um, anyway, the, the, what I realized after we did the demonstrations was some people asked some really great questions in office hours, and I realized from the questions that there were sort of some gaps in what the book was describing in terms of magnetism with the Biot-Savart law, Ampere's law, forces on a charged particle, but uh, some gaps between that and real life practice where you have like a battery that supplies current and connects it to say a conducting wire or a conductor. Because there's things about a battery that aren't really explained when we study magnetism, but they're important for current. And there's things about batteries that are very confusing. And I know that in this class, some of you are interested in doing engineering. If I don't give a basic treatment of batteries in terms of the direction of the current and everything, I feel like I wouldn't be giving you a, a good, solid overview of everything. It's, it's good to go through the textbook, but the textbook has its limitations, and that's, it's become very apparent. But before we do that, let me give, uh, I need to address a couple of important points that have been brought to my attention. So first of all, What's the situation with the homework? Once you, once you complete the homework, are you not able to access the problems anymore? Is that the case? You are. Okay. Because a student messaged me and said they weren't able to access the problems. What? Yes? Go ahead. So what's the what's the what's the trick to getting around that if you say if you, you so he said there's some kind of thing where if you have multiple attempts if you try another attempt it keeps you from going back to see the other what's so what's the way to get around that just don't do another attempt so so okay so when I do the when I make the assignments then what I need to do is I need to just assign one attempt from now on and just give like infinite tries because I just want people to do it for practice. Okay, great. Okay, so that was just that was just my not understanding how the system worked exactly. So I'm going to make if people don't have access to the homeworks, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to repost the assignment with just one att with one attempt, quote unquote, and then multiple as infinite tries so that if anybody's having that problem, they have access to the homework and they don't get uh, limited by that. I'm going to do that for the other class too. So that's an important point. Gr good. So now I understand that. Um, okay, there's another important thing that I need to mention. Oh, yeah. Okay, if you're CAE and you get extra time, I recommend taking it with me because I did upload an exam, but it has a little piece of information that... It's not critical to doing the quiz, but it's useful just to have this piece of information. Um, so I recommend just doing the exam with me and following me to office hours to finish it for the extra time at the end of class. Um, you don't have to do that. You do have the option just going straight to the testing center, but I do recommend actually going to, actually doing the exam here and then just, yeah, get the extra time because I, I printed out new versions of the exam in the meantime. I made a little change to it to make it more clear. Um, okay, so that's the homework and the exams. Okay, finally, um, this is, I think I made this pretty clear, but I, I'm still getting questions about this. So now while pretty much everybody's here, I can address this. The homework, if you attempt the homework, even if it's late, 
you'll get full you'll get full credit for the homework it's not uh, meant to be a quiz or a test it's meant to be a learning tool and you're not supposed to be graded on it or lo lose points even if you don't have it done on time I don't believe in that the quizzes are and the midterms and finals are there to demonstrate your knowledge of the material once you've learned it not the homework the homework you should get full credit for it so don't worry about what your grade in mastering physics says you're gonna get a full the full percentage of the homework I think it's like five percent of the grade but it's still something and so you get you get that and then you demonstrate your mastery of the homework and the concepts on the quiz and the, also those exams so don't worry about your grade on the mastering physics you did the homework even if it's late you get the points um, okay so then that's that's that point um, I think what we're gonna do is oh yeah somebody pointed out that it might be helpful for me to devise formula sheets basically take all the important formulas from the um, sections that we do and put them on a nice piece of paper that I can put as a file on my um, on my you know on our canvas page and I think that's a great idea I think that could be really helpful for doing homework um, this is the first time I've ever taught this course so I didn't have this compiled ahead of time I think what I'll do is I'll have it so that for the next class I'll have the whole thing ready and I'll just have it like lines dividing it up chapters by chapter yes you will you will but this is a this is an independent point about having like a master sheet of all the formulas you could ever need basically and then using that sheet when you're doing the homework so that you get practice with like okay I can I a lot of people like to learn that way uh, and I remember doing that too I remember making my own sheets with all the equations it's kind of nice to write them out yourself because it's sort of a nice learning tool but I, I also like the idea of making an equation sheet so I'm gonna I'm gonna work on doing that I'll try to have that done by Thursday we'll see what happens but I'll, I'll try to get that done so that you have a tool to learn for the first midterm which is I believe next week so let's talk about the midterm now um, so the midterm is going to be heavily weighted in favor of weeks one and two because that's that's the uh, majority of the material that I've taught the most heavily so you're gonna see you're gonna see a lot more material from weeks one and two there's not gonna be a whole lot from week three so if you if you want to you can hold off on doing the week three homework a little bit and just focus on weeks one and two because I'm probably not gonna put Faraday's law on the first midterm but it's definitely gonna be on the second midterm so it needs to be studied but but because of how things worked out with the one in the other class that I'm teaching the discussion sections are on different days so I was gonna do like if, if I did like the third week material they wouldn't even have a chance to have a discussion section half the class wouldn't have it so I couldn't do that and then I just decided it's better to do the first midterm let's just focus in on those first two weeks because there's a lot there so that's a sort of a heads up on what to focus on pretty much anything that I talked about in lectures from magnetic dipoles to forces on parallel wires th forces obviously forces on charges forces on conductors that kind of thing is going to be important and then what I'm going to do today is instead of going over new material like Faraday's law and stuff I'm actually going to have like a review session where I not only we're going to go over some of the stuff that we did um, before but we're actually going to talk about how this actually works out in some of the demonstrations that we had the other day because I feel like there was sort of um, it was a little bit confusing like figuring out the direction that the current was going in the battery and things like that so I, I sort of prepared my own little like lecture going over like the difference between a force on a charge or a, or a current carrying conductor from a magnetic field and the magnetic field itself caused by that because the two they both involve the the cross product and they look they look pretty similar on a superficial level but they're actually pretty different 
uh, one of them falls off as a 1 over r squared, for example, the magnetic field one does. So, so we should talk about those differences because it has a lot of, um, it's a useful way to visualize the, the geometry of it, which can be very tricky. Uh, the geometry for the different coordinate systems. You know, you've got, you can do into and out of the page representing z and the page itself representing x and y. Sometimes in the book it does like north and south and x, y. Um, I prefer into and out of the page or just z. One of those two is what you're going to see on the exams. I'm never going to deal with north and south because that can be a, just a little bit confusing when you have it done that way for some of the problems. Okay, so with that, let's sort of talk about some very basic things that we've learned about magnetic fields. So we know that magnetic fields always are dipoles. They're never monopoles. There's always a north and a south. And two like uh, pulled magnets will repel from each other. So when the arrows face each other, it's like they're bumping up against each other and pushing away. So you can think of these two magnets as repelling because the two north poles are going to push away. And then on the, on the other uh, extreme, if what's going to happen if one of the magnets on the left is free to rotate, just like a compass, it will rotate so that the south end aligns with the north pole of the other magnet. So when you have a compass and you're looking at the, the, pole, the magnetic field of the Earth, when the compass points north, you're actually pointing to the Earth's south pole. So now we understand why, what they mean when they say that the North Pole is really the South Pole for the Earth, because that's how, that, that's how the process with magnets works. And then with, these, with this demonstration that we had uh, last Thursday, we've got this bar magnet, and you can see these iron filings, and they line up next to the magnetic field. So really what's going on here is this, this big magnet is so massive that it's not really affected by all the little magnetic fields of the little iron filings. Those are all magnets too. And the total magnetic field is not just the field due to this big bar magnet. It's due to all the little ones too. But it is so small that it doesn't really contribute very much. Maybe it creates a little bit of that irregular pattern on the X on the outsides of it. But basically the pattern you see is pretty much all due to the bar magnet. And so wherever the iron filing happens to be, it sort of does the compass thing. It sort of rotates and points in the opposite pole to the bar magnet. And so that's, that's really what we're looking at there. That's how, that, that's how we can trace the magnetic field and see how magnetic fields work. And then this is just another um, picture of how that compass works with the, um, you know, the North Pole is really the magnetic south pole and the direction of the lines go from north to south on a magnetic field. So then we have this um, B field for a moving positive charge now. And that's a bit different than a bar magnet because for a bar magnet, it's sort of going from north to south, but for the point charge, it's just sort of encircling it if we put our, our hand out. So we, we need to be careful when we're thinking about the B fields due to moving charges because they're, they're, they are sort of like magnets, but they're also quite different. So we have to be careful about not overgeneralizing too much and understanding that this, this B field for this moving charge is actually a very complex thing. It's, it's constantly changing direction. I mean, the direction is constantly changing for the bar magnets too, but it's, it's, it's changing direction in such a way where it's also falling off with distance. So there, the, the strength of that B field is reducing as you get further out, which we'll sh I'll show more in a few more slides. Okay, now I'm going to talk about batteries and current because in some of the demonstrations that we did uh, Thursday, we needed to use batteries to generate a current. 
So it's very important for us to actually know which direction the current is flowing in a battery because we all sort of know intuitive we all know we've heard that actually it's the electrons that do the flowing so which which way do the electrons go how does a battery actually work so here's how a battery works the battery has a bunch of electrons that are separated from a positive terminal so all the electrons that do the useful work in a battery they live at the negative terminal they're all piled up there and they're not allowed to cross between the negative and the positive that's sort of what makes it a battery to begin with the the ingenuity in designing a battery involves figuring out a way to separate charge charges negative charges from positive to create an actual uh, net current a collection of electrons here where they can't go this way they can only flow around and in the process of flowing around they do useful work like they light objects light bulbs and things like that that's electricity but wait a second the positive terminal is the direction that we think of with the current we think of current as going from positive to negative so how does that how does that actually work then if we have that system what's actually going on in the battery so it turns out that negative current actually flows from the negative to the positive terminal but a negative current flowing in one direction is the same as a positive current flowing in the other so when you have these problems where they show a battery and they show a positive and they show it hooked up to some current and it's going through some magnetic field what are you going to use for the direction of the current you're going to use your right hand because a current flowing from negative to positive is mathematically identical to a positive current flowing from positive to negative so so in other words with with a battery we can treat it as if it was a collection of protons flowing from this positive to this negative terminal even though it's the opposite of that so that's important so so if you're if you're tracing the path and you want to figure out the direction that it's going in you want to make sure that you're using the right hand the positive current convention if you're going from positive to negative because that's that's how it's defined in the book and that's how it's defined for batteries but that's very confusing if, if it it doesn't really talk about that too much in the book especially in the magnetism section but that's very important for understanding the demonstrations so then what we had here then is when when I hooked up the the battery to it I had some current and I also had a magnet and the magnet the magnetic field from the magnet the poles are labeled there they go from north to south so I know my B field is going up in that case and then if I follow this line this wire from the positive terminal you can see that it leads to the going this direction and up so then it's out of the page QV cross B out of the page but if I if I if I use the direction of the electrons I would get the opposite answer to that if I went from negative to positive so just remember that when you're doing problems with batteries you want to use the sign convention that's that's used in in currents and everything else where you treat it as a positive current even though it's actually negative electrons flowing the opposite direction final restatement of that does that make sense to everybody I know it's a little bit confusing but that's a very important point to yes so we're very clear about that okay great okay so you can see the positive current so then the negative current goes from right to left through the magnet we can use our right hand and say a positive current goes from left to right through the magnet and correctly predict the force on the current segment outward now there was another question a really good question came up in office hours yeah think about this one for just a little bit there was a good one a good question that came up in office hours about what's the difference between like the magnetic is a magnetic field a force field and is is the magnetic force 
that a, that that a charged object feels due to like the same phenomenon of the actual B field. In other in other words, you have a, you have some current that's flowing. The current that's flowing creates a B field. But then we also have if the B field, the current that's flowing interacts with another magnet, we've got another B field. Just like this case here. So so we've got We've got some, some B field going around encircling this wire. And then we've got some force on the wire outwards. How are, those two, how are those two B fields connected? Are they connected? And how could we really sort of test that? Well, we know, we know that it's a little bit um, different because we can first calculate the force using this cross product. Uh, let's see. Do I want to do this slide yet? I feel like I don't want to do that slide just yet. One second. Let's see. Okay, I want to do this slide first. Let's see how we're doing for time. Doing great. Okay, so I can do this QV cross B for the force felt by the on the current. And we're just talking about the direction. We're not worried about the magnitudes here. We're just saying, what's, how do the directions compare? And I have like this QV, which is in the, so if I call this, if I call this magnetic field here, uh, I'm gonna use blue actually. I'm gonna keep with the same color that are on there. So we have this magnetic field. It's blue and it's south. We have this north pole here That's going to go from north to south, right? Any arguments about that? Okay. Then we've got this current going this way, this I, which we can call QV. Everybody agree with that? Okay, let's, let's create a coordinate system now. And, and pay attention to this, because this is good practice for like taking a problem and inserting your own coordinate system into it and thinking about everything in 3D. Because that's its own like sort of skill set that you need to have for this portion of the course. So we have I hat, J hat, and K hat going out like this. Okay, so I'm going to say, um, what's the direction that this that this wire, this loop of wire, is going to going to feel if we do the QV cross B? The V is going in the I hat direction based off of that coordinate system. So we're going to have QV I hat cross B J hat. Everybody agree with that? Okay. So then what does that give us? Let's not worry about the magnitudes of these right now. We'll just put numbers in front. We have a positive and a positive. So we have a 1, 0, 0. That's QV. That's I cross J, 0, 1, 0. Okay. And then we take that cross product. We cover up the first one, 0, 0, 1, 0. I hat minus, cover up the second one, 1, 0, 0, 0. J hat plus, cover up the third one, 1, 0, 0, 1. K hat. So then this is just 0, this is just 0, this is 1. So we have the direction of the magnetic force in the k hat direction. Now, that's that's my force. Now I could ask, what what about the direction of the magnetic field though? Is there is there a way to sort of figure out what the direction of the magnetic field is and where would I choose? I know that the magnetic field is zero here because my um my I, my formula for the magnetic field there, dB, is mu zero over four pi I dL cross R, where R is the unit vector from the element where the field is measured. So I have to sort of figure out where do, how do I make use of this? So let's go back to our, let's go back to our definition of what finding these magnetic fields from our previous lecture. 
So we're going to have to go back to lecture four. We can do that. Let's see, it's on here somewhere. I think it's right here. Okay. I'll just look it up, actually. Open recent. Lecture four. Okay, so we have lecture four. So we see here that our formula, by the way, I, I made a slight error when I was doing this before. It was along the z-hat direction. I had it oriented along the x-y. That's why I got the, the incorrect result. It should have been oriented along the z. But anyway, we see here that our dl, it points from our dl and then r-hat to the field point. So what should we do to compare? Well, we know that the force is along k, right? This is the force from the b-field onto the wire. Where, what's the magnetic, this is an interesting question to ask. What's the magnetic field at this point, not due to the magnetic field here on the f that causes the force on the wire, but from the wire itself. So let's draw that wire in here, and then let's see here. So we're going to have a DL. It's going this way. And then we have our formula, mu naught. We're not really worried about these constants or these values for this, because we're just looking at the direction. We could always put numbers in here to figure out. But here we just have, and then it's going to fall off as 1 over r squared. So we have that magnitude on the bottom. But we have IDL cross r. So that's the key difference. So the formula for, for the force was QV cross b. There was no fall off as 1 over r squared, by the way. But forget about that part. Just look at the cross product. We're not crossing it with the same vector. It's a different vector entirely. So we can see how different these two things actually are. And that's very important because I just covered both of these topics within the span of like a week. So it could be very easy to confuse these two up. So this way we can see how different and distinct they actually are. Yes? It is, it's built into the current, I. I is a current. It's a velocity. It's a QV built into the term I. It is, great question. So she asked me, why, what, what about the velocity? Why isn't a factor? It is, is built into the current. So the current, it's, they're using a different symbol here, but remember, a current time, a, a charge times a velocity is a current, right? We all in agreement about that? Okay, great. Makes sense? Makes sense too? Okay, great. Okay, so we have this we have this current. Now remember, we're trying to compare. We're saying, does it go in the same, does the, for, does the magnetic field from this go in the same direction as this? Let's see, now we can figure this out. So which direction is I? I is just a magnitude as well. Which direction is DL? DL is an I hat. So we have I hat, forget about this mu naught. I'll just write it here so you don't get confused, but you can just see, we're not really worried about this uh, mu naught 4 pi i over r squared. We're really interested in this, or even this dl. We're interested in this i hat associated with the dl. So we have this unit vec, this i hat, and then we're crossing it with r. What's r in this case? It's k hat. So the magnetic field direction at the same point where the force on the wire, where the wire is feeling this force due to this b field, is not going to be in the same direction. It's going to be in the i hat cross k hat direction. One, zero, 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 one. So let's see what direction that's going to be then. So we cover up the first one. We have zero, 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 one. i hat minus, we cover up the middle one. One, zero, zero, one. One, zero, zero, one. j hat, and then cover up the last one. One zero zero zero, k hat. So this one's not going to contribute. This one's not going to contribute, and then we're going to have a negative j hat as the direction. So the force, the the magnetic field from this current caused by the current, is in the negative j hat direction, while the force on it that it's feeling due to the other magnetic field is going to be in the k hat direction. So that's that's very interesting. 
So, and then finally, one final question. What if, if let's say hypothetically, I'm right here in the middle of this thing, right here in the middle of this magnet. What, what if I had a third charged object? What magnetic field is that third object going to feel from these, from these two alone? Let's say I'm not going to worry about the, the third object and the effect it has on the other ones. I'm just going to say, if I bring in a charged object, what's the net magnetic field that the third object is going to feel as a result of this wire and this magnetic field? Think about it for a second and see if you get the right answer. The right answer is that the magnetic field obeys the principle of linear superposition. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a single vector that's the sum of the two vectors that we had from the magnetic field. But it's not the k-hat vector because that's the force that the wire feels. Right here, the charge, some other charge, is going to see a contribution going this way from the magnetic field. So if we had a third charged object that just right here, we put it in orange, it's not going to see a magnetic field along the k-hat direction. That's the force that the wire feels. It's going to see a magnetic field going this way from this magnet. So that's j-hat. So it's going to see a vec it's going to see a magnetic field in the j-hat direction. And then it's also going to see a magnetic field in the minus j-hat direction. Very interesting. So depending upon the strength of these two magnets, we could actually maybe cause these to cancel somehow. And actually, yes. Um, it, the particle's charge will, will change the way it responds to the field. But the field that is there, that is present, is independent of the charge. What the charge tells us is how the field responds to how it responds to the field. But the field is the same, yeah, the field is the same regardless. That's a, that's a good question. That's a subtle point. Yes. Because what I did was I said, okay, if, if I, okay, sorry, you know what? Let's, let's, um, I did, I did make this, so the R is in the K hat direction because I'm saying what's the magnetic field? at the same point where there's a force. The force is in the k-hat direction. So like instantaneously at this wire, right? When the wire's along the field, the force is in the k-hat direction. That's why the thing kicks up. And then what I'm saying, it, what I'm saying is, what's the, what's, the, um, what's the magnetic field then if at that same point caused by the wire? Because the wire, the wire is going to have a magnetic field not just in the k-hat direction. It's going to be in all. It's going to be encircling the whole wire. Does that part make sense? Okay. So the mag so the wire has a magnetic field encircling it, but I'm interested in the k-hat direction because that's the place where it feels a force from the other magnet. So I'm saying, what is what does the magnetic field of this wire segment look like? in the same direction that it's feeling the force from this magnet. Does that make sense? That's, so yes, so I'm, compare, I'm trying to compare apples with apples as much as I can and say what, what's the correspondence between the force that the wire is feeling and the magnetic field that it creates on its own because, of it, because it has a current flowing. All right, was that, was that little... Uh, demonstration helpful and working through the differences or was it confusing I'd like some feedback for this yes y yes we can say we can say that it's slightly displaced into the z direction so that that so that that reasoning works that's a great point Yes, this particle has to be slightly displaced in the z direction in order for us to say that it is feeling that it is that it is doing yes, that is a good point. Any any more feedback about this? Does that help make more sense between yes?
Yes, so what I did was I found the magnetic field due to this magnet alone, which is essentially like a bar magnet. And, and then at, that, at first, I actually calculated the force that this magnet causes on the wire because it, because it feels a force due to this magnet. So actually, that's what I did first. And I said, okay, the force is in the z-hat direction out, and that's what we saw in class. Then what I said was, wait a second, this wire itself also produces a B field. What direction is that B? And I know that the B field that this wire produces goes in 360 degrees directions and it encircles it. If you wrap your fingers around, it goes like this. But what, but what is the direction of the B field of that circle when I'm right at the Z hat position where it feels the force. Is the B field from the wire the same as the B field from the magnet? And it's not. The B field and the magnet is going this way, going up. And it's not the same direction as the force that the B field exerts on the current either. Still confused. It's okay to be confused. It's okay if you are. It's, 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 no, it's going all, it's, it's wraps around completely. It doesn't just go in one direction. It goes, it goes in all directions and you have to calculate it based off of the cross product. If I picked a different point over here, the B field due to the current here is what? Zero. Because it's zero along the direction that the current is traveling along, either parallel or anti-parallel to it. Yes. What it, what it tells us is that the B field behavior is very complicated and that we can't, we can't say that the force on the B field, do, the force on a current carrying conductor is in the same direction as the B field that that current carrying conductor produces. And now we've demonstrated that. So I'm sort of demonstrating how these two rules, even though they look very similar and they vo both involve a cross product, they're actually very different things. And I, didn't, I wanted people to know, understand that difference because they're, it's not just true for current carrying conductors, it's also true for charged particles in general. We could do this analysis again for just a simple charged particle interacting with the B field and we get the same result because a current is nothing but a long string of charged particles. And then also I did this example because I thought that the battery was a little bit confusing because you don't know, you know that it's negative charge flowing but you don't know to use the right or the left hand. So I was explaining this is why you use the right hand because the right hand can still describe the flow of current. It's just that the current is actually flowing the opposite way in the battery. But the current, negative current flowing one way is the same as positive flowing the other. So that was the other reason I did this example to sort of make sense of if you get a battery and you want to figure out which direction is the current going to make sense of it. Does this example make sense to everybody? Anybody, does anybody have any uh, questions or thoughts about it? Was it effective in illustrating differences? Yes. Yes, and that, the, and that the magnetic field due to this magnet is very different in nature to the magnetic field of the wire, too. And the directions are not the same. But that's confusing because you wouldn't, that's counterintuitive because if you took two magnets, you would, you would see they're related, right? You'd have, if you have like a, if you have the magnetic field of the earth and you take a compass, the compass rotates and responds to it in a very specific way. But we can't, we can't make that same simple uh, assumption for these magnetic fields in general. But, and then at the same time, a third thing that makes it a little bit complicated, the superposition of the magnetic fields at any given point is going to be different than the magnetic force that it feels as well. And that's because magnetic fields do not act parallel to where they do the force. When I push on this desk... The force is in the same direction as my push. Magnetic fields don't work like that. They always go parallel. But here's the thing. 
Think about how much more complicated this is mathematically. If I push on a desk, there's only one direction that's directly parallel to it, but there's many directions that are perpendicular to it. It could be down, left, right, up. That's why that cross product is so important in figuring out what that exact direction is. So what I recommend you do for, for these problems and when you're practicing the homework, practice, you can practice the right hand rule, but practice doing this cross product and you make a habit of making the cross product your main tool weapon of choice when you want to actually figure out the direction that things are going in. Um, because that's going to be more useful, I think, for solving these kinds of problems. Okay. This Wi-Fi is terrible. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. Okay. But that's all right. So does that, anybody have any more questions about this example? All right, I'd like, I'd like some more feedback in office hours. Tell me if it was helpful. Did anybody think it was confusing and didn't helpful? You can be honest, I don't care. Okay, seems like pretty, pretty decent. Okay, okay, good. We're not quite done with this lesson yet. There's a couple more things I wanna talk about. Um, so here, here's another example, okay? Here's, here's another example. So this is from the book, and this is a question somebody asked me about in office hours because I didn't really have a whole lot of time to go over this in uh, class because we had all these other things going on. But you've got this problem, and it says, which direction should the current be flowing in, in, in order to make the battery, the compass needle up directly above, flip to the, to the west, to the northwest? Okay, read this problem over because this is going to illustrate um, how, how a magnetic field works in a current carrying wire and the direction that it goes in. This is actually a, a, a pretty decent example conceptually to follow. So you want to figure out, you have this figure, it shows a circuit, lies on a horizontal table, compass is placed directly on top of the circuit. The battery is connected to the circuit so that when the switch is closed, the compass needle deflects counterclockwise. So which direction is the current going? That's essentially what they're asking you. Should the battery be positive to negative or should it be flipped the other way so the current's going the other way? So we want to do A, positive to negative. And here's a sketch, here's a sketch of the magnetic field due to the current and also the magnetic field due to the earth and the compass, which is the third magnet, follows the linear superposition of those two magnets put together, except look at the polarity of it. Look at the polarity. So this is important. Those first two magnetic fields, the magnetic field associated with the current and the magnetic field associated with the Earth, point from north to south because that's the direction that it's going in. But this, this third magnet, it's actually pointing from the north is attracted to the south. So these aren't vectors. This, is just a, this just represents the compass responding to the two directions, the two southwardly directions. So the B field, one of them's going in my, the way I picked it, one from the current, it's going this way. And you can see that because, so if I have a, if I have a current, a magnet, that's flowing, that's, that's compass that's directly over it, it's going to feel a magnetic field this way, right above it. But if it's on the other side here, it's going to feel a magnetic field this way. So um, that's another important point. So if I, changed, if I changed where I put my compass, if the compass was not on the top of that current, like it is here, if it was off to the side here, it wouldn't feel a magnetic force in the same direction. Like if it was off to the side here, the magnetic field would be pushing it that way at that point. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So always do the uh, cross product and you can see why the direction of that is what it is with the cross product. Because we have this current element going in some direction and directly above that's going to be out of the plane of the figure, 
Z hat, okay? If it's placed on top of a if it's placed on top of a current a current loop like that, the compass is going to be in the Z hat direction because it's above the XY. So now you can see you can do that. So right? I think that should be Let's see let's see if we can get that result. It should be in the Z hat, right? Because we've got it so we've got a QV uh cross R we want to we want to know what's the what's the magnetic field due to this wire the the r is in the the k and the the v is in the minus y so we've got we want to use i cross qv or i cross r this is essentially current so current in this figure is going like this so it's negative j and then r that's directly above it. That's going to be k hat. So negative j cross k, I believe. So what does that give us? We've got 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then we've got minus 1, 0, 0, 1, i hat. So it's going to be in the negative i hat direction. So by doing, by doing the cross product there, we get the correct result. So that's a lot easier that's a lot easier to see than trying to take your hand and say, "Hmm, which way is the finger going? Is it a, is it going up? Is it going up or is it going this way?" This is more precise. So that's why I prefer doing that because we get the negative x direction, which is the correct result by doing it with this. And we don't worry about the magnitudes, we just do it real quick. We just take, okay, we know one's going this way, one's going this way. Just look at the cross product of the unit vectors easy. Could be a really long, complicated calculation, but it turns out to be simple that way. Does that make sense, what I did there to everybody? Okay. Is this helpful for problem-solving strategies, give, showing how you do this quick little calculation with the cross product to make it a lot easier? Okay, great. Great. Yes, question. Okay. The reason I decide for the unit vector R for this circuit is because um, if, if I have this plane of this piece of paper, imagine you have an X and Y axis, right? I cannot set that compass, I cannot immerse that compass inside that piece of paper. If, if, that, if that was a table that had a hole in it and I could actually somehow immerse the compass within the paper, then I couldn't say that it's K hat. But as long as the compass is placed on top, you could think of it like this. This is my piece of paper here. I've got I hat minus I hat. And then I've got my compass here, okay? The compass is placed on top of this coordinate system. It must be in the positive K hat direction. It must be in K hat. If it was behind this thing somehow, it would be in the minus K hat direction. Even if it's, even if it's only just a little bit on top of it. And see, that's tricky, right? Because in this picture, it lives in flat earth on a piece of paper. There's, there's no way to see that compass just sitting on top of that. You have to imagine that. Does that make sense, though, why I can assume that it's in the k-hat direction now? It has to be, yes, you have to choose the direction of our hat from the point of the current. So what I, what I did here is I said the current is going this way. The current is going along minus j. So I draw a point from somewhere along the current, the dl of the current, towards the r hat, which is the compass, which is in the k hat direction. So it's that vector. That's the decision I made. If the compass was over here, let's do this problem again. If the compass was over here, what's my r hat now? My r hat is different. Let's say I move the compass and I say, what's the magnetic force on the compass due to the current now? It's different. This is my R hat now. What's my R hat? It's going to be positive what? I hat because it's moved over here somehow. And it sort of would have to be immersed in the paper. Actually, technically, if I was going with the same logic, it would actually be Z and I hat. It would be like a, a, a combination. But let's just imagine that it could be immersed in the paper, that we could put it inside that, that paper region. 
so that it's just along the I hat. So then let's calculate that. Let's see what the magnetic force is here if it's just along the I hat direction. So we've got QV or I is 0 minus 1, 0. And then this is going to be 1, 0, 0. So then we figure out the direction that it's going to be going in here. Which way is the magnetic field, the compass going to feel? The force of the magnetic field is going to be, let's see, we've got minus 1, 0, 0, 0. I hat minus uh, zero zero one zero J hat plus zero minus one one zero K hat. So then the force that it's going to feel here is going to be like zero minus minus one times one. It's just going to be k hat because it's 0 times 0 minus negative 1 times 1. So positive k hat. So the magnetic force is going to be going this way. The magnetic force is going to be going this way. Right? The B field from the current is going this way. And then this is north to south. So which way is the compass needle going to start pointing? Which way is the compass needle going to start pointing? It's going to start pointing in this direction. Compass needle's direction is going to change. So if I, uh, this would be a cool experiment to do, actually. Just hook up a wire and take a compass and move it around to different parts. I'm sure that's how they came up with this law experimentally. So you know somebody did that. Somebody in a laboratory in the 1800s hooked up a current to a source, and they took a compass, and they said, oh, how does this change? Hey, look, it kind of like does this 360-degree thing. Let's get out some trigonometry. Let's see if we can figure this out. Maybe we'll be lucky, and nature follows some perfect pattern, and it does. It follows like almost a near-perfect pattern. But you can see how that process worked now. Okay, yes. Uh, so it's no because because the current's going the current's going this way, yeah the current's going this way. It's not it's not going through the magnet anymore. Great great question. So does that does that figure make sense to everybody? I didn't label it super precisely. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Okay, cool. Okay, we're right about at the break mark. This is what I want to do. I want to do just like a quick break and then I want to do like a little bit more review and then we'll do like the quiz at the end for like the last whatever I said in the syllabus I'll have to look it up again I think it's like 20 minutes 15 20 minutes yeah and then we'll do that okay so uh, 10 minute break starting now all right let's get back to the review so somebody asked me a question about what about, the, what about the magnetic field of the wire on itself? So basically, what doesn't this magnetic field, doesn't this wire exert a, fi a force on itself or something at this point? It does not. So that's the thing. So when you, just like electric charge, there's no self-force mechanism. There's probably a really interesting uh, fundamental reason for that that's probably like related to physics unification essentially about why that doesn't happen because that's sort of the same idea for mass how you can't exert a gravitation you you can't exert a force on yourself and that's really it's in, it's the it's an interesting concept but anyway just remember that you don't you don't have a magnetic force on the wire due to itself it only it would cause a magnetic force on this magnet but that magnet is really essentially not affected because it's so heavy. So, so typically, when we're not seeing an effect on the other magnet, there's sort of this assumption in the problem that the other magnet is very heavy, so it's not going to rotate. Obviously, if you have two equally similar compasses and you put the two together, the two compasses are going to rotate and, and align in opposites from north to south, just like two magnets that are free to rotate because of their respective B fields 
on each other. They're going to feel the effects of the other B, each other's B fields. But for a problem like this, this magnet weighs just so much more, and it, it's just not close to the weight of this wire. So only the, the big one wins out, and we only worry about that. But we could technically, we could always calculate the force that the wire has on the magnet. And, and how, would we, how would we do that? But there's, another, there's sort of another problem with that too, though, because with, the, with this rule, right, this, is for a, this isn't for just any old magnet. This is for a moving charge. So this magnet isn't a moving charge either. So there's also that thing that we have to think about too. So we have to be a little bit careful when we use these laws. They're not as general as F equals MA, where we're used to just using one nice big equation for everything. We have to sort of look at the fine print here and remember that. So that's a, that's a key point. That's why we're only doing two, mainly two chapters on the first midterm. We want to look at the fine print, read everything carefully, make sure we understand. Um, focus on the homeworks, but don't over-focus on the homeworks. Also focus on the concepts. Focus on what we talk about in class and the lecture. Um, don't, you know, don't, don't overdo it, but also don't, you know, just keep a nice, good, broad overview of everything. And now I'm going to sort of talk about which topics I think would be good for you uh, to look at. So first I want to look at this first lecture. So the first lecture, we definitely want to be looking at fundamentals of magnets, how magnets operate. Add batteries and currents to that list too. Okay? And then we want to definitely know how to do... Um, Know the difference between a magnetic and an electric force. That's important. We want to know the magnetic forces on moving charges. We want to be able to know how to use that formula that we used so much just recently. And we want to know how to use it for both currents. It's the Biot-Savart. It turns into the Biot-Savart law. Well, actually, no, that's a little different. Sorry. It turns into a different rule for currents. It's just the force on a current-carrying conductor if it's for currents. And then if it's for a charged particle, it's this. Um, so we got we definitely want to know that. Know the right hand rule. Um, know how to do this. Take a field in some direction in a charged particle. Tell me the direction it's going in. Things like that are useful to know. Um, and then don't forget like these little conceptual ones. Which path does it take? Why does it take that path? Why doesn't it just go straight up? Why does it take a while to curve? Maybe things like that would be useful. That's just a general physics understanding, to ha nice to have. Um, okay, definitely know how to do the cross product. We've done that a lot in class. Um, that's more of making use of this, this little rule here for the force magnitude. Know the difference between a magnitude and a vector because this formula gives you the magnitude, but you also need to know how to find the direction. You can use the right-hand rule or you can use the cross product, your choice. But for problems, you're probably going to have to know how to do both. Okay. Um, and we did a lot of good examples. Okay. Um, magnetic flux. Don't forget about magnetic flux. Remember that we have the sum of a closed surface is zero, but we may not have a closed surface, and then we have to do some little bit of math to, to tell the difference between what the field is and one what the total flux is through one surface, it's the sum of the surface through one surface plus the flux to the other surface equals zero. But the, the, the sum has to be zero when the whole thing is closed. So an example, if I have a bottle and I have the cap, if I take the cap off, then I don't have a closed surface anymore. So I calculate the difference in the flux for the surface area being the difference of the lid, the cap versus not. Yes. Uh, yes. So it's going to be dot DA. There's an integral. Uh, that's the, that's the, f that's the, um, the general form. And then we've got the little differential B dot DA. So the, yeah. The, so if you don't, if you do the integral, you get phi B equals BA. Because, because in this class, we're not going to be dealing with variable B fields. So the B field is always going to, okay, there's another confusing point about constant B fields. This one came up on the homework. So if you have a truly constant B field, 
where the B field is the same in all directions, there's not, necess there's not gonna be a force felt. But, but you see, the thing is, is when I say a constant B field, I'm just saying it in one direction. But if I have a constant B field going this way, that doesn't mean I have a truly constant B field. It's not the constant in all the directions. Yes. Uh, they do not hold. Newton's laws do not hold for magnetic fields unless you make them relativistic. So that's, that's like, that's Albert Einstein's big discovery. We can talk about, we'll talk about that more later on. Newton's magnetism violates certain uh, Newton's, certain aspects of Newton's third law. Yes. Because the force is not always equal and opposite. Yes. No, don't do any, don't do anything with Newton's laws as for forces. You don't want to touch those. You want to stick strictly with the magnetic force laws that we've talked about. I haven't written F equals MA on that board once, so don't. And there are, there are uh, problems in the book that kind of do use that if they, t they talk about the difference between the gravitational and the magnetic force, but that's just too confusing at this stage in the game. I'm just going to leave, I just left that out because it's, I, I want to be cl crystal clear on all the concepts and not introduce too many over complexities to this game. You got to know the basic rules of the game first to play it right. We don't want to be, we don't want to overcomplicate things with technicality rules that's for like the next the next year if you could decide to go on and become a ref or something <laughs> and uh, get a degree in physics which is definitely a cool thing to pursue but anyway um so that's that's important no magnetic flux uh let me see how we're doing for time i don't want to run out of time okay um so i think that's everything for the first lecture that you need to sort of know about. Now let's do the second lecture. So in the second we talked more about magnetic flux because I ran out of time and we did that little example. So that that's sort of that's sort of nice to do. There's no promises that any of this is going to be on the exam, but I promise you some I promise you one of these will be. Okay, that's a promise. You're going to see something with a magnetic force on a current carrying conductor. We got to test that. You may not have to know exactly what the drift velocity is, but you not you got to know how to calculate that. Um, so know how to do all of those problems, finding the force on a force carrying conductor. Um, you don't have to derive it, but it's kind of nice to see it derived because you sort of see how current incorporates into QV then. Because somebody asked me a question about. What, what, why isn't QV in there? It's I, but it, it comes from this. So the current is built into this QV, uh, this expression here. So yeah, you can, you can, that's a kind of nice derivation. So then we got the force on a conductor. Um, these are some key points to keep in mind. All very useful. Just remember, yeah, it's not a vector. The DL is the vector part. Yeah, just doing these kinds of example problems is helpful. Um, and then... This is another example. Uh, knowing about force and torque. So I didn't talk about Newton's laws, but I kind of I kind of lied there, didn't I? Because I did talk about torque, and torque, torque is torque is Newton's laws, but in the angular momentum form. So I have force is the rate of change of momentum. So F equals dP by dt. Torque is the change the the rate of change of angular momentum with respect to time. So dL by dt. But for your purposes, just remember that torque is force times lever arm and understand how magnetic forces can produce a torque. Because we can have a situation where the net force on a current carrying loop is zero. We did that one on the board a few lectures ago, and um, which I'm sure is gonna be coming up next, right. So the net force on this is zero, but there's not a zero net torque. So that's important to sort of know about. Um, and then definitely know about that magnetic dipole moment. Let's not forget about that. Mu, so confusing. We've got, we've got like three different mu's. We've got mu meaning like micro, mu not meaning the permeability of free space, and then mu meaning dipole. Just you gotta know all three of those. I'm gonna have to do something with the formula sheet to differentiate all of those and put like tons of boxes around this thing. This is not the same as mu naught, you know. This is a totally different thing. It just looks the same, you know. 
Okay. Um, this will be better. So then that's study the dipole moment. Know about that. Solenoids, very important. Know how to do solenoids. Know the solenoid example. That's just a, basically it's just a dipole, a current loop with multiple loops. Very straightforward. Uh, very nice to have on an exam. And then know, you know what? Know energy of a magnetic dipole too. That's important as well. Definitely want to know that. So pretty much lectures one and two are pretty much solid, like you're going to need to know a lot of this stuff. And then lecture three is, let's see. Okay, lecture three is sources of magnetic field. Yes, you, know, you got to know the Biot-Savar rule. Got to know that. Um, that's definitely going to be on there. Um, you got to know um, forces between two pro moving protons. That's useful. So forces between two charges, two moving charge particles. That's a that's a useful one. I would definitely study this one. Don't don't think that you're just going to have one charge particle all the time. You might have multiple. Um, and you can you can use this force on a moving charge to calculate that and get this nice result. Um, and then you can look at the ratio between the electric and the magnetic. I wouldn't worry too much about the electric ratio. I would just focus on the magnetic for this exam. We didn't, we didn't do too much with Coulomb's law. Just focus on the magnetic. You won't see the ratio on there. All right, current. We, no current convention. X, it's directed into the page. O, it's out of the page. If, for our purposes, if it's, in, if it's into and out of the page, that's our Z direction, okay? If, a page, if the page is X, Y, into, out of the page is Z, into the page is minus Z, right? We all agree about that? Okay, because I know that's very confusing. We're, our brains aren't wired to see I, J, K hat wherever we look. <laughs> it takes a little bit of time to get used to that. Okay, we're almost, we're basically right about time. We've got about five minutes to go. I'm going to start it at 11.28, hand them out, so that you have 20 minutes. At, it ends at 11.50. Um, some people have other times. They get more time with something. That's fine. Um, okay, so know this. Bio Savar. Um, know how to calculate forces, B fields at certain points due to Bio Savar. And then current carrying conductors, this stuff we talked about. Know how to figure out where the B field is at different points for multiple wires. And know how to use Ampere's, Ampere's law. No, no forces between parallel conductors as well. Yeah, know all of this. This is all important stuff. Why is there so much? Okay, I'm sorry. I missed, why is there so much talking? Was there any issues or something on the slides? Okay, people are just being noisy. Okay. Um, and then I'd say, I'd say lecture four as well. So the first four lectures, just pretty much be comfortable with that. And then um, I'm going to tell you what, since people are getting noisy and talking, let's give everybody like five minutes to sort of study. Just like pull out your notes and study. Okay? Go ahead. And then you have to put and then you have to put everything away when I actually hand out the exams everything has to be put away